welcome. My name is Dana Brown. I'm Zojo's Director of Marketing. In this tutorial, we're going to continue working in our personal expenses app. We already know how to save and retrieve the expenses data from the disk. And in this chapter, we're going to see how to display the total expenses by category using a graphics bar chart. So as you can see here, we'll be able to paint the total expense by category. In fact, our bar chart will allow us to set the width of each column on the fly and also to select between the flat colors or gradient colors. Um, in addition, we'll be able to select between displaying a drop shadow or not. The bars will adjust proportionately to their height and to the height of the containing window. So how can we do this kind of control in Zojo? The first thing we need to add to our project is a new class, in this case named as bar, being a very simple structure of data. We will create instances based in this class to store the data to be drawn by the chart. As you can see here, this class only has three properties in charge of storing the color for the bar chart, the label associated with the bar, and the numeric value to display. In order to simplify the creation of new instances, we can add a constructor method that will take the expected values as parameters, that is a label, a value as a double and a color. So the constructor will simply assign uh, these to the properties. The bar class is the mechanism that will abstract the expense data from the bar chart itself. Uh, this means that it doesn't need to know if the value or the label is for an expense, a product, or any other concept that we may want to display in the bar chart. Next, the way to draw the bar chart itself is through a class created from the existing Canvas class, something known as subclassing. As you can see in the Zojo library, one of the available controls is the Canvas. As its own name implies, you can think about the canvas as an empty painting canvas where you'll be able to draw anything you want in the available surface. In fact, you only need to access the contextual menu and select the new subclass option in order to add a new canvas subclass to the project. In fact, when we select the subclass item in the navigator, we can see how the inspector panel display canvas, displays the canvas as the super for the subclass. That is the class it is based on. In addition, and as a general rule, when we create a subclass, it inherits all of the properties, methods, and events available in the class it is based on. So in this particular case, we will have all of the methods, events, and properties from the Canvas class at our disposal. One event of special interest in the Canvas class is the paint event because they will execute the code responsible of doing the drawing on the canvas. For that, it will provide a graphics context through the G parameter and that we can use in order to use all the available drawing methods and properties from the graphics class. If we look at the documentation for the graphics class, we can see that this one includes methods to set properties related to the drawing of text, like bold, uh, for the font that we want to use, the drawing color, setting the italic style, font size, and many, many other drawing attributes. Among the available methods we can find from the ones allowing us to draw simple shapes as rects, ovals, lines, or even more complex paths, draw existing pictures into the canvas at the desired size, draw text, etc. So keep in mind that the graphics class is the one providing all of the needed stuff to paint while the canvas class and its subclasses uh, are the ones that provide the surface to do the drawing through the paint event. In fact, these two classes combined are the usual way to create UI controls. In addition to the available properties from the canvas class, we also added a few new ones to our subclass. That means that these will only be available for the instances created from this class, but not for the Canvas class. One of these properties is mBars created as an array of bar instances. 
We also added three more properties that will be in charge of storing the width value for the bars, the use of flat or gradient colors as a Boolean, and the use of the drop shadow, or not, also as a Boolean. The way to assign the data to be displayed by the bar chart is through the bars method. In fact, we added the name of the method twice, one as a getter where it will return the array stored in the mbars property, and a second time as a setter where it will store the mbars property, uh, the, the array received as a parameter. The important thing here is the call to the invalidate method. This is the way to tell the canvas that it needed to redraw itself. So it makes sense to do that every time it receives new values. This is the same thing we do when setting new values for the other properties. But if you take a look into these properties in the inspector panel, you'll see that their scope is private. That means that these can be accessed outside of the class itself using the dot notation from our code. We want to control the values received and even execute additional actions every time these properties receive a new value. For that, we create what is known as calculated properties in Zojo. When we do this, Zojo will add a couple of methods associated with the property. One of the methods will be the getter, that is the method returning the value. And the second one will be the setter, which is the one in charge of setting the new value to the property. For example, the get method for the calculated property mbar width will return the value stored in the mbar width while the setter will control that the received value is in between the allowed minimum and maximum range before setting such value in the mbar width property and calling to the refresh method. The refresh method also instructs the canvas to draw itself, but to do it immediately, while the invalidate will do the drawing, taking into the account the needs of the operating system. In both cases, the paint event will be executed. And here is where we include all of the code required to do the painting of our bar chart. For example, here you can see how we make use of the color dot is dark mode method in order to set the drawing color to dark gray if the user has it set in the preferences to dark mode, or to the white when the computer is set to clear mode. Then we will use that color to draw a filled rectangle covering all of the available surface in the graphics bar instance. As you can see in the Zojo documentation, the fill rectangle method receives as parameters the x and y coordinates from the origin, and then the width and height values for the rectangle. In a canvas, the starting coordinates 0, 0 is the point in the upper left corner of the canvas surface, while the width and height will be calculated to the right and down respectively. In the next line, we change the drawing color again to draw a new rectangle, adding as the marquee for the color. The next lines of code are responsible for doing some starting calculations, like finding the longer text label from the bar instances, being one of the references used to do the drawing. Then we use a for each in order to iterate every bar instance stored in the mbars array, proceeding with the drawing of the bar itself in the calculated x and y coordinates and the width set by the user. We also read the Boolean value stored in the shadow property in order to know if we need to draw the drop shadow. We can draw this kind of drop shadow by creating a new instance from the shadow brush class. Once done, we can access its properties to set the offset point for the shadow, amongst other things. Then we only need to assign that shadow brush instance to the shadow brush property for the graphics context G. But what about drawing flat colors or gradient colors? I'm glad you asked. We read the Boolean values store in flat color, and if it's true, then we create a new instance from the linear gradient brush class. Once created, we can set the starting and endpoints of the gradient to the start point and end point properties. Then we can add as many gradient stops as we want through the add method for the gradient stops property. That property expects a pair data type, and as its name implies, it is a data type storing two given values. Gradient stops also expects that the value at the left in the pair will be a percentage value between the initial and final points, while the rightmost value will be the color to use. As you can see here, we're using the white color for the first and last points of the gradient, 
Making the transition between the white to the color stored in every bar instance from 0% to 40% and from 40% to 100%. The gradient will be applied to the brush property and such property will be used as the drawing color for the fill rectangle drawn next. As you can see, the graphics context gives you a great amount of control of the things to be drawn and how to draw them. The most important thing you need to remember is that every property set in the graphics context will be applied with its current value until you change it. So how can we use our control? For our example project, we simply add it to a new window named Window Stat. You can add new windows to the project from the Insert menu and add new controls to it by simply dragging them from the navigator to the window as you would when adding new controls from the library. In this case, it's not a document type window, but a sheet window. We can set this kind of window using the pop-up menu type from the frame section in the inspector panel. This kind of window doesn't have the usual document window widgets, like the one for closing the window to minimize or maximize it. Instead, it allows us to show the window as the child for the current one, the one that is active. So here we can see the new graphic bar instance dragged from the navigator and named graphic bars one, and where we use the locking section from the inspector panel so the control changes its width and height as the user resizes the containing window. We also added the controls that allow the user to set the bar width, the use of flat colors, and also the use of a drop shadow or not. The checkbox for the drop box has in its action event handler the assignment of a Boolean value to the shadow property of the graphic bars one property being the same for the checkbox control in charge of setting the flat color property. Finally, we put into the action event handler of the push button the code that closes the window. We do that by calling the close method on the self object. If you remember from a previous chapter, while me refers to the object itself, which would be the button, the self keyword will refer to the object that is the parent for the object. In this case, it's the window containing the button. So self.close could be read as windowstats.close. For the slider control, it's the one to set the bar width, and we implemented the value changed event handler here to set the bar property of the graphics bars one instance to the current value of the slider itself. But how can we display this window from code? That is what we do in the action event handler for the show stats push button. Once the event handler is fired, it simply calls the show method for the window stats window. Finally, in the window stats window, we also added the open event handler, whose code will be executed when the window is open. What we do here is retrieving all the keys from the categorized expenses dictionary. Remember that the keys in that dictionary are in fact the expenses categories. So we iterate over these keys using a for each block to retrieve all the expenses under every category. Using a second for each block of code in order to calculate the sum of all the expenses under the same category. Then we create a new bar instance using the key as the bar instance label the total value as the value to display and setting a random color as the bar color. In order to get a random color, we need to create a new instance from the random class and the inRange method to get a value between zero and 255 for each red, green, and blue component of a new RGB color. Now we only need to set the total variable again to zero. Once we iterated over all the keys, we only need to assign the tbars array containing all the bar instances to the graphic bars one dot bars property, and this will instruct the graphic bars instance to draw itself through the invalidate method as we saw previously. Once we saw all of the code involved in the creation of the bar chart, we can run our example again so we know how everything works since we click on the show stats button until the bar chart is drawn. Obviously, there are some things that need to be improved. For example, our graphic bars class still doesn't take care of showing more bars than is possible from the available width. We also need to improve the category section. These are defined in code right now, which means that our users can't 
use more categories than the existing ones. These are some improvements that we will add in the next chapter for the course. In addition to the ability to save and retrieve the categories from a file as we already do for the expenses.